Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome to this lecture by Dr. Anthony Affigny, sponsored by the Critical Dialogues Working Group and the President's Council on Inclusive Excellence. <clears throat> My name is Professor Jeremy Campbell from the Anthropology and Sociology Department here at RWU. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to um, tell you all about, if you haven't uh, heard of it already, uh, tell you a little bit about Critical Dialogues. Uh, Critical Dialogues is a research forum for members of the RWU community that encourages academic dialogue designed to deconstruct and reinterpret power structures. Today's event is in conjunction with another Critical Dialogues event that happened earlier this week, some of you may have been to, a research forum entitled Interrupting New England. Um, and the idea of that was uh, to feature student and faculty research on marginalized communities and non-dominant histories in our very region, New England. Uh, held on Wednesday, Interrupting New England drew a large crowd for a lively discussion on important issues of power, inequality, culture, and community in New England. And we hope to continue these discussions today as we invite Professor Anthony Affigny to the stage. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Affigny, professor and former chair of the Department of Political Science at Providence College, and also visiting scholar at Brown University's Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. Dr. Finier has been a pioneer in the field of ethnic studies, both within the discipline of political science and more broadly. His research examines Latino political history and behavior, post-colonial racial systems, and community politics in U.S. cities. He has published widely in top-ranked journals, served as the editor for the International Encyclopedia of Environmental Politics, and in 2011 was the recipient of the prestigious Frank J. Goodnow Award from the American Political Science Association in recognition of his leadership and career-long contributions to the profession. Professor Finney's current projects include research on Latino racial politics, studies of gender, race, and political consciousness, uh, and an analysis of the new Latino National Survey. The title of his talk today is, as you can see on the overhead, Latino Emergence in New England, Cultural Crisis, Political Opportunity, or Both. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Professor Anthony Afinia. Thank you very much, Professor Campbell, and thank you all of you for being here this evening. Uh, I'm delighted to be at Roger Williams University tonight. I've been here several times before, but this is my first opportunity to deliver a lecture, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I will run through some prepared comments, and uh, we'll, there'll be some overhead slides for you to follow along as I talk, but I will try to leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Hopefully, uh, my lecture will stimulate some thinking and some questions, and I'm happy to address those as we go along. When the sun rises over New England, uh, more than 2,000 miles from the Rio Grande River, as far as you one can get from Mexico and still be in the continental United States, its rays fall across richly colored images of La Virgen de Guadalupe in thousands of Mexican-American homes in cities like Bridgeport, Hartford, Providence, Worcester, and Boston. In fact, by the time of the 2010 census, several hundred Mexican-American families could be found as far into the Northeast as Bangor, Maine, the easternmost city in the United States. Yet Maine is not unique. In the first years of the 21st century, the nation's Latino population grew to more than 50 million persons living and working in every region and every state, transforming local politics of all kinds from rural towns of the Central Plains and Deep South to the very largest East and West Coast cities. In New York City, for example, the Latino population of Harlem is now larger than that historic neighborhood's black population, reshaping New York's political dynamic and threatening to upend the national politics of the Congressional Black Caucus when the new demographic finds its way into congressional redistricting. In fact, the seat once held by Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., and currently in the hands of Charles Rangel, may soon have a Latino incumbent. Halfway across the continent, softly spoken Spanish, punctuated with children's laughter, can be heard at Cub Scout PAC meetings in the heartland of Missouri. In Colombia, PAC 121 was recently formed as that city's first Hispanic PAC, where young Latino boys and girls recruited into the Boy Scouts of America's Hispanic Initiative start each PAC meeting the same way Cub Scouts have done for decades by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Even in the Deep South, cities and towns still resolving centuries-old black-white racial tensions now confront new challenges. 
incorporating America's fastest growing Hispanic communities. Between 1990 and 2000, Latino population in southern states nearly doubled, from 6.8 million to 12 million people, then rose again to more than 18 million in 2010, a far quicker pace than in the Northeast, Midwest, or West. Moreover, the rapid increase among Southern Latinos contributed to a broader racial shift in the South, where non-Hispanic whites increased their numbers by only 4.2%, while the combined minority population of Black, Asian, Native, and Latino grew by 33.6%, the fastest minority population growth rate in the country. This is the Old South. This is the Confederacy. By 2010, Latino population had more than doubled since 2000 in Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, and Maryland. Around Huma, Louisiana, for example, in a state whose overall Latino population grew by 79%, a doubling of the local Hispanic population led to most of that area's growth. And the many Latino-owned businesses serving new Hispanic residents have become that rural economy's most dynamic sector. Similar patterns are seen throughout the South. Finally, in Western states, home to America's oldest and largest Hispanic communities, California was, after all, northern Mexico until 1848. Both old and new Latino communities hailing from Mexico, Central, and South America, Latinos are embroiled in bitter political debates over immigration policy, education, and criminal justice, even as their growing numbers fuel insistent demands for increased political power and representation. In fact, Hispanics now comprise the single largest share of the population in the nation's second largest city, Los Angeles, whose nearly 4 million people in 2010 were 48.5% Latino, 28.6% white, 11.3% Asian, and 9.2% black. Agitation to make Los Angeles city government more representative of its diverse population has intensified, and Latinos are, as they, as they have been since 1970 in Los Angeles, the main force in this debate. This pattern of Latino population growth, demands for empowerment, and corresponding backlash, as in Arizona, recurs throughout the West and Southwest. In every corner of the nation, then, we see evidence of a Latino emergence, unprecedented for its speed and breadth, driven by new immigration as well as by youthful, growing families, posing challenges to scholars and participants in U.S. politics for whom understanding the character and potential of Latino politics remains a work in progress. The 2010 census made clear the extent and pace of change which is occurring. Between 2000 and 2010, the Hispanic population in the United States grew by 43%, while the non-Hispanic population grew by just 5%, and significantly, the non-Hispanic white population grew by just 1% between 2000 and 2010. In every corner of the nation, as you can see in the, on the slide and from what I've just said, the uh, Latino population is becoming, uh, in some cases, the largest and in many cases, the most politically salient of the populations uh, which characterize a very diverse country. But who are Latinos? When we talk about Latinos, who are we talking about? Well, we need to do a little bit of history in order to understand that. Latinos, wherever they may be found, are descendants of immigrants or are themselves immigrants from former Spanish colonies in the Americas. Today, about 60% of all Latinos are U.S. citizens. The largest Latino populations are those who trace their lineage to Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Some Mexican Americans are descendants of people who lived in the American Southwest long before that area became part of the United States. They may trace their ancestry to the region's indigenous peoples prior to 1492, or they were citizens of the Mexican nation before 1848, when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the U.S.-Mexican War. Puerto Ricans were also brought into the United States by conquest. In 1898, the Treaty of Paris uh, ceded uh, from the Spanish Empire to the United States, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. Nineteen years later, 1917, all residents of Puerto Rico were given U.S. citizenship, which they had not asked for. And from that time to the present, all Puerto Ricans born on the island or on the mainland are U.S. citizens from birth. My grandfather was born in 1890 in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico. He was eight years old when the U.S. military invaded Puerto Rico in 1898. And in 1917, he was one of the first Puerto Ricans drafted into the U.S. Army to serve in France, 
one of the oldest photographs I have of my grandfather is a photograph in his private uniform in the U.S. Army in Paris, France, uh, just before his return to the United States. Some Cubans migrated to the United States in the 1800s, but most of today's Cuban Americans have arrived after 1959, many of them uh, with parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents who uh, arrived in the United States following the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Before 1965, before the Immigration and Naturalization Act, most Latino immigrants came from Puerto Rico or Cuba. Afterwards, migrants from Mexico, Central, and South America, and the Caribbean became the nation's largest immigrant population. The Immigration Act of 1965 opened up the doors to increase Latino migration from countries which had previously not had the easy access that Puerto Ricans had as citizens or that Cubans had as special refugees following the Cuban Revolution. In New England, the Latino population dates back to the early 1950s. Uh, the earliest Latino migrants for whom we have names and addresses are Colombian and Puerto Rican migrants from, from New York City and from, directly from Colombia, from Medellin, Colombia, uh, to Central Falls and to Providence. Puerto Ricans first arrived in New England as agricultural workers outside Hartford, Connecticut, working in the tobacco industry, the tobacco fields of Connecticut. Other Puerto Ricans came to Massachusetts and Rhode Island to work in industry. So by the end of the 1950s, there were already two large and growing Latino populations in New England, uh, the Puerto Rican and the Colombian. In Rhode Island, Puerto Ricans were soon joined uh, by the Colombians, and then in Boston, Bridgeport, Hartford, and Worcester in the 1950s uh, through the 1980s, additional uh, uh, Puerto Ricans primarily uh, arrived in the region. Beginning in the 1980s, uh, increasing numbers of Dominicans, Mexican, and Guatemalan, Guatemalan migrants also arrived in the, near, in the New England states. At present, uh, Latinos from every national origin community can be found in New England. Are Latinos just like other Americans, or are there significant and politically salient differences between Latinos and other Americans? Well, in fact, there are significant differences. The most important of these is socioeconomic status. Compared to non-Hispanic whites, Latinos tend to be younger and poorer, tend to have less education, lower skilled jobs, and suffer significantly higher rates of unemployment. It is also true, however, that one can find Latinos at every level of the socioeconomic and at every level of the labor market distribution. Although Latinos are found in disproportionately low levels in the professions, they are found in the professions, uh, in medical, legal, corporate, and other professional levels as well. However, even Latinos who have significantly more education than is the norm for the Latino population as a whole, even those who work in higher status positions, disparities in median earnings are evident and they are significant. Latinos at comparable levels of education earn significantly less than their non-Latino counterparts at every level of the labor market. These income disparities sustain a wealth gap where Latinos, in which Latino households have fewer assets than their non-Hispanic counterparts. This was seen most recently in the economic crisis and the housing crisis uh, in 19, uh, from 2008 to the present. Uh, in which median Latino household net worth fell faster than for any other group in the U.S. population. In fact, between 2005 and 2008, Latino households lost nearly 66% of their wealth. Median wealth for Latino households fell by 66%. This was greater than any other population. In fact, the median non-Hispanic white household now has 18 times the wealth of, the, of their Latino peers. Now, not surprisingly, the uh, the socioeconomic profile of the Latino population has also led to stereotypes and false images of Latinos in the popular mind. Uh, popular representations, especially in news and entertainment, emphasize subordination to whites and emphasize deviance from the white norm. Latinos have typically been depicted as criminals, as lazy and or drunken workers, and as being poorly socialized into American society. If you have lived in the United States for any number of years, you are familiar with these stereotypes of Latinos. In fact, in Hollywood movies, we have characteristic tropes, characteristic ways of portraying Latinos, which we see again and again. El Bandido, the Latino criminal, the half-breed harlot, uh, the light-skinned but somewhat morally loose female, the male buffoon, uh, the sombrero-wearing, uh, probably drunken Mexican, uh, the female clown, uh, the Latina who is uh, perhaps oversexed and certainly uh, 
uh, over humorous. Uh, the Latin lover, male and female. Uh, uh, over, again, a hypersexed or oversexed individual. And finally, the dark lady, the mysterious uh, dark haired, dark eyed Latina. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. Review any of the films made in the United States in the last 80 years in which Latino and Latina actors uh, appear, and you will find one or more of these characteristic images represented. At the same time, though, more positive representation of the Latino family stability. Latinos have among the most stable family structures in America. Latino significant labor force participation. Latinos can be found at every level of the labor market. Latinos entrepreneurial achievement. In every city in which Latinos are a significant part of the population, Latinos also provide a significant portion of entrepreneurial economic activity and economic growth. The cultural vitality and diversity and the political engagement of Latinos all of these are much more difficult to find in the American media. One is much more likely to find depictions of Latino drug dealers and criminals than one is to find depictions of Latino physicians, astronauts, and so on. Are there any Latino astronauts? Anyone familiar with Latino astronauts? There is a former Latino spatial astronaut who is running for Congress in California as we speak. His Republican opponent went to court to try to force Hernandez to stop calling himself an astronaut on his uh, uh, election materials. As it turned out, the court sided with Hernandez after he produced ample documentation, including photographs from the International Space Station, proving that he is, in fact, an astronaut. Increasingly, however, Latinos are establishing counter-narratives. Latino media, Latino writers, Latino intellectuals are establishing counter-narratives and independent venues for self-expression, including the Spanish language media, newspapers, magazines, radio, and television, as well as the production of intellectuals, artists, and entertainers. Here in Rhode Island, we have two Spanish language, uh, three Spanish language radio stations uh, and two Spanish language newspapers with regular and large circulation. Uh, there is an independent media in which much more positive and much more accurate images of Latinos are represented. How many Latinos are there? Well, in the census of 2010, the Census Bureau, uh, did any of you fill out a census? Were any of you the people responding to the census questionnaire? You might have seen question five on the, on the uh, very first page of the census questionnaire. It says this, please answer both uh, the race and the Hispanic origin question. Question six is about race. Question five, which is depicted here, ask, first of all, is the person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? First box, no. Second box, yes, Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, then Puerto Rican, then Cuban. Yes, another Hispanic. And then uh, there's a space for the respondent to write in the name of their country of origin. Uh, question five resulted in 50,477,594 persons self-identifying as Hispanic or Latino. That is an increase of 15.1, almost 15.2 million people over the census of 2000. Well, where do these Latinos live? As the maps, this is a Census Bureau depiction of Latino population share at the county level. You can see in the, in the southwest from California to Texas, if you look at this, those areas that have the darkest shadings, that is the, the counties in which the Latino population exceeds 50% of the population, all of the darkest blue counties, almost the entire Rio Grande River Valley in Texas, most of the border, border counties all the way to California, as I said a few minutes ago, those places used to be Mexico. In fact, in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ceded to the United States more than half of the territory of Mexico. And that is still the place in the United States where we find the largest concentrations of Latinos. You'll see the concentrations are also quite dense in southern Florida, and there's another concentration in the northeast, a megalopolis stretching from Washington, D.C. to Boston. A different question we could ask is, where is the Latino population growing the fastest? Again, the darker blue shading are places, counties, where the Latino population between 2000 and 2010 grew by 100% or more. The darkest blue counties, the population grew by more than 100%. You'll see that a fairly large number of these counties are, in fact, in the south, as I reported earlier, and also in the northeast. You can even look up into New England. You'll see that the fastest growing regions of the country for Latino population were not the places where the Latino populations have been concentrated, but in fact represent a significant population shift into the rest of the country. And again, every 
single state in the United States, all 50 states, saw an increase in Latino population between 2000 and 2010. No states were left out of that story. There are more than 20 countries in Latin America from which Latino individuals and families trace their personal immigration or trace their family heritage, to which nations of origin do the largest Latino communities trace their lineage? Well, the answer is, in the United States as a whole, this is the entire country, the largest single Latino population is Mexican Americans, 31.8 million. And that 31.8 million in 2010 represented a 54% increase over the prior uh, decennial census in 2000. The second largest is Puerto Ricans, 4.6 million. In the census of 2010, we learned that for the first time, the population of Puerto Ricans on the mainland United States now exceeds the population of Puerto Ricans who live in Puerto Rico. So the Puerto Rican mainland population is now larger uh, than Puerto Rico itself. The Puerto Rican population grew by 35.7%. Cubans remain the third largest population, although Salvadorans and Dominicans are coming up fast. As you can see, the Salvadoran population at 1.6 million is just shy of the Cuban population, but the growth rate for Salvadorans was more than 151% between 2000 and 2010. The Dominican population grew by almost 85% to 1.4 million. The Guatemalan population grew by 180% uh, to one point, just over 1 million, and the Colombian community, which is not, is not yet in the uh, top six uh, Latino populations with a uh, total population greater than one million, but it won't be long uh, before the uh, Colombian population exceeds one million with a growth rate of 93 percent between 2000 and 2010. Well, how are these Latino national origin groups distributed around the country? We can also see a distinct and striking pattern when we look at the Census Bureau's mapping for uh, the uh, distribution, the, the residents of Latinos. We see that most of the country, uh, the, the largest uh, Latino population is Mexican, the light blue, is Mexican Americans. In South Florida, uh, the state of Florida, the largest Latino population is Cuban. Uh, in the Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, Maryland area, uh, the largest Latino population is Salvadoran. Through almost the entire Northeast, with the exception of Maine, Vermont, and Rhode Island, Puerto Ricans constitute the largest Latino population, and Rhode Island has the distinctive characteristic of being the only state in the United States where Dominicans constitute the largest Latino subpopulation. Uh, Rhode Island is yellow. I don't know if you can see it on one of these screens, but uh, Rhode Island stands out. So New England looks different. Actually, let's go back. Look at New England. Uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, all distinctively Puerto Rican, Rhode Island distinctively Dominican, uh, and to the extent that a very small Latino population uh, exists in Maine and Vermont, uh, it is predominantly Mexican. So Rhode, New England, uh, and in addition to New England, New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey, look very different from the rest of the country. This can be traced back to the migration patterns. We talked about the West being former Mexico, and of course the western states and southwestern states are very close to Mexico and can still receive significant numbers of migrants. Florida uh, was the port of entry for Cubans after 1959, but how did Puerto Ricans get all the way from down here to New England, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey? The answer is quite simple. In 1954, a flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico to New York City cost $35 to fly from San Juan, Puerto Rico to New York City, $35. Those Puerto Rican migrants to the Northeast did not walk, they did not sail, they flew. They landed on jets at Kennedy Airport, LaGuardia, Idlewild, Newark, and took up residence in the Northeastern states. You might also realize that uh, the first district, the first uh, circuit of the U.S. federal court system, District 1, also includes Puerto Rico. All right. New England looks different. So which Latinos live here? Well, these are the numbers. In New England, that is the six New England states, the largest population, Puerto Rican, next largest, Dominican, then Mexican, Guatemalan, Colombian, Salvadoran, and Cuban. Again, the growth rate just in New England, not for the country as a whole, but the growth rate in New England for Dominicans over 114% between 2000 2010, almost 90% for Mexicans, 168% for Guatemalans, 
almost 79% for Colombians, 173% for Salvadorans, and 34% for Cubans. Well, what about Rhode Island? If we break out Rhode Island, is Rhode Island distinctive? Well, yes. As I said, Rhode Island is distinctive. Rhode Island is distinctive partly because it has the largest percentage Dominican population in the country. It is the only state in the country where the Dominican population is the largest of all the lat local Latino populations. Um, and as with the rest of New England, the Puerto Rican and Dominican population, the Caribbean Latinos are the largest group. In fact, we can look even a little more closely at Rhode Island. And if you look at the uh, table, several of you got handouts that were available. Uh, there are four pages of, of tables. Let's look at those for just a minute, if you have them. The first table, table one, is Rhode Island's population change by race and Hispanic or Latino origin. Between 2000 and 2010, the non-Hispanic white population in Rhode Island fell by 6.4%. In fact, without a significant increase in the minority population, Rhode Island would have lost population and would have lost its second congressional seat. We would have joined the unhappy group of five states that only have one member of Congress. Fortunately, we did not do that. We retained our status since 1790 as having two members of Congress. The Hispanic or Latino population increased by 43.9%. The black population increased by 23%. The Asian population by 28%. People who reported that they were, came from a two or more races background increased by 12.8%. Some other race, which is generally Latino, increased by 5.5%. The American Indian and the Native Hawaiian populations fell slightly, but if you look at the last column, you'll see the numbers are quite small. So the overall white non-Hispanic white decline of 54,748 was just slightly exceeded by the growth in the minority population. Again, the, what growth did occur in Rhode Island, 4,428 additional residents was entirely attributable to the minority population, and most of that was the Latino population. If you turn to Table 2, a look at the, what, what that gets us. What that gets us is in 2010, a population which is 76% non-Hispanic white, 23.6% minority, and of that, the largest group is Hispanic or Latino, 12.4%. Comparing uh, Table 3 to the other New England states, you can see that Rhode Island is distinctive even in New England. It is probably fair to say that there are actually two New Englands. There's Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, which, looks a, which look a certain way, look uh, similar to one another racially and ethnically. And then there are the northern New England states, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, which look very different. You can see this in Table 3. Uh, Rhode Island's Hispanic population share of 12.4% uh, falls just behind Connecticut's at 13.4 and uh, somewhat above, uh, somewhat uh, ahead of uh, Massachusetts at 9.6%. Final table to look, and you, if you look at the bottom, you see the, the New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine, much smaller percentages of all of the minority populations. The final table, and this is the one where Rhode Island is most distinctive, is a table. Uh, identifying the racial self-identification in Hispanic populations of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Now for this table, we went to, uh, remember at the beginning question five was the Hispanic or not Hispanic question. The next item, question six, then asked people, what race are you? Are you black or African American? Are you white? Are you Asian? Are you Native American? And so on. Latinos can be of any race. Now, in American popular discourse, it's, it's common to hear Latinos described as a race. But that's a little confusing, because Latinos can be black, can be white, can be Asian, can be indigenous, can be some mixture of the above. Anytime you've ever seen a federal report that identifies Hispanics, you've seen a footnote that says Hispanics may be of any race. And that means exactly what it says. So when the question six, the race question, is asked of Latinos, we then sort ourselves by race after first sorting ourselves as Hispanic. And what we see is that among Rhode Island's Hispanic population, the smallest percentage in New England self-identifies as white. The largest percentage in New England self-identifies as some other race, neither white nor black nor Asian nor indigenous, something else altogether. And the black or African American Hispanic category just slightly behind Massachusetts at 6.6 percent. Again, two or more races. Also, Rhode Island is at the top of the ranking. More Latinos in Rhode Island identified as being of two or more races. Uh, same for American Indian 
and Native Hawaiian. More Latinos in Rhode Island self-identified as being indigenous and not white and not black. Rhode Island is distinctive in this way. It has the smallest share of Latinos who self-identify as white. Now that is important because nationally more than 50% of the Latino population self-identifies as being white. Compared to the national Hispanic population, in fact, the part of the Rhode Island Latino community which self-identifies as black is more than double. Only 2.5% of Latinos nationwide call themselves black. In Rhode Island, almost 7% of the Latino population self-identifies as black. Not surprisingly, we can explain this by looking again at the national origins of the Latino population in Rhode Island. Overwhelmingly, uh, from Dominican, uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, uh, two islands which are historically centers of the slave trade in the Caribbean, have large numbers of African descent people uh, and large numbers of Afro-Latinos. Guatemala is a predominantly indigenous nation, so Latino immigrants from Guatemala are much more likely to describe themselves as indigenous, uh, but certainly not to describe themselves as white. So when we look at the national origin profile of Rhode Island, it's not hard to understand why it is that Rhode Island Latinos look so different from Latinos in other parts of the country. So what does all this mean? All of these data, all these numbers that I've given you, what does it mean for politics? What does it mean for society? Well, looking only at Rhode Island, and I apologize for trying to cram so much information onto one slide, but in the elections of 2010, Rhode Island's Latino communities achieved new levels of political influence and participation. But we also began to experience firsthand, for the first time, a very powerful anti-immigrant and anti-Latino backlash, recently afflicting much of the country. You may recall, if you were in Rhode Island in 2010, that one of our candidates for Congress, uh, Republican John Laughlin in the 1st District, was running television commercials showing a wall dark, in the dark of night with dark and somewhat indeterm racially indeterminate people clambering over the top of that wall. It was actually lifted from commercials that Republican candidates in the Southwest run frequently showing illegal immigrants jumping over a wall and finding their way into the United States. It was a little funny. I mean, who was invading Tiverton, Rhode Island? Mexicans climbing over a wall from, from, from Westport, Massachusetts? I don't know uh, where the image came from. But that was the first time that I can remember in Rhode Island political history that a candidate for U.S. Congress had run such a, an extravagantly and obviously anti-Latino and anti-immigrant uh, political commercial. He lost the election. And he lost the election by a smaller percentage than the Latino population of the first congressional district. So there are more than, more than one scholar who look at that and would attribute his loss to some extent and David Cicilline's victory uh, to very strong support for Cicilline among Latinos in the first district. Not only that district, but in other races. When the elections were over, Latinos in Rhode Island were said to have been decisive in electing the governor, in electing the secretary of state, who won narrow victories, as well as the capital city mayor, who won in a landslide. Latinos may also have provided the support I just described for first district congressional candidate David Cicilline. Uh, Ralph Mollis won his race for secretary of state by 1.2%. He got 86% of the vote on the south side of Providence, and almost all of the Latino vote went to Ralph Mollis. There's nobody in Rhode Island politics who would not attribute Mollis's narrow victory over Catherine Taylor to his strong support among Latinos. For our trouble, he then introduced the voter ID bill. Along the way, nearly every candidate, every major candidate who utilized anti-immigrant rhetoric including the Democratic candidate for governor, were defeated. Nearly every major candidate who utilized anti-immigrant, anti-Latino rhetoric, including the Democratic candidate for governor and the Republican candidate for Congress in the first district, were defeated. On the Providence City Council, Josephine DeRuzzo, who was the longest serving elected official in Rhode Island history, served for 28 years on the city council, and that was after eight years on the school committee, was defeated by Sabina Matos, a young Latina, Silver Lake, and the youngest ever city councilor in Providence, a Dominican by the name of Davian Sanchez, was elected to the Providence City Council as well. Two embattled Latino incumbents, Miguel Luna 
and Luis Aponte both successfully defended their seats against strong challenges. Miguel Luna has since passed away, and he was replaced in a special election by Carmen Catillo, so there are now two Latinas on the Providence City Council. And most dramatically, for the first time in its history, the city of Providence elected a minority candidate as mayor, the son of immigrants from the Dominican Republic, Ankel Taveras. Now, that's the, those are the opportunities and the apparent success of the Latino population in Rhode Island, the Latino electorate in 2010. But there are also challenges. Some of those challenges are these. Hispanics comprise 12.4% of the state's population. Other minority communities contribute an additional 11.2%. But all of the minority communities remain severely underrepresented in elective office. For example, minority legislators are just 5% of the state Senate's membership, two senators, Pichardo and Metz. This means that while non-Hispanic white Rhode Islanders comprise just 76% of the population, non-Hispanic white, white politicians hold 95% of the seats in the state Senate. If Rhode Island were Alabama, we would be under federal jurisdiction for severe malapportionment of our state legislature. Likewise, there are just five minority members of the House of Representatives, three of whom are Hispanic, Grace Diaz, Anastasia Williams, and Leo Medina. This represents just 6.6% of the House membership. Again, if the House of Representatives in Alabama or Georgia or North Carolina were 95 or 94 percent white, those states would be under direct federal supervision through the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. Similar underrepresentation can also be seen in municipal offices. As very few Latinos have been elected to city councils in Central Falls, Providence, Pawtucket, Woonsocket, and Cranston, even though these communities have the state's largest Latino populations. In fact, those five cities combined are home to 82.8% of the Latinos in Rhode Island. Almost 83% of all the Latinos in Rhode Island live in just those five cities. There are three Latino city councilors in Providence, or four rather. There are uh, one Latino city councilor in Central Falls, zero in Pawtucket, zero in Woonsocket, and zero in Cranston. So even though these cities have large Latino populations, those populations are not represented. Now there's another way we can look at the changes in Rhode Island. We've looked at politics. Let's look at the culture or the atmosphere or the environment for Latinos. Uh, earlier today, I, I searched the Providence Journal to see if I could find any comments uh, in the online Providence Journal. I did find an article from uh, April 2nd uh, reporting the arrest of several thousand uh, illegal immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants, that is, around New England. Uh, and of those 3,100, 13, uh, 13 were in Rhode Island. 100, uh, those around the country, 3,100 around the country, 145 in New England, 13 in Rhode Island. A small sampling of the comments uh, that accompanied that article. We should, quote, get all of the freeloading aliens and their families out of the state and quit providing social services to them. The people of Rhode Island can't afford the burden ant, ant long, I, this is a direct copy and paste, I did not spell this. We cannot take care of our own needs, good job, deport them, said an anonymous poster who called himself Rudy Kazuti. Another comment, good work, but you missed about 3,000 people living on Broad Street. It's not clear whether this person is talking about Broad Street in Central Falls in Pawtucket or Broad Street in Providence either way. He's clearly talking about the Latino and African-American population, but predominantly Latino population, most of whom are citizens. The vast majority of Latinos in Rhode Island, 80 to 90 percent of Latinos in Rhode Island, are either legal documented immigrants or are U.S. citizens. In fact, about 60 percent of all the Latinos in the United States are citizens. Bangor, Maine, which I mentioned earlier, now has several hundred Mexican-American families. Two-thirds of the people in those families speak English every day. They are not primarily Spanish-speaking. They are primarily English-speaking Mexican-Americans living in Bangor, Maine. The final comment, there's a lot more illegals here than 13. All one has to do is take a stroll down any street in the, quote, sanctuary city, referring to Providence. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Now, this might not disturb you as much as it disturbs me, but whenever someone talks about Latino immigrants and uses um, gunfire metaphors, it reminds me of the people, the two men who were killed just three days ago by uh, camouflage-garbed 
uh, vigilantes on the Arizona-Mexican border and left to bleed to death in the Arizona desert. I don't know that this poster was talking about actually shooting fish, but I don't like seeing shooting in the same sentence with Latinos because it happens far too often. Here are the cultural realities. Never mind those, those, uh, those demeaning and insulting uh, uh, characterizations of Latinos as being illegal and deserving to be shot like fish in a barrel. Rhode Island Latinos, and we know this because we, uh, in 2007 and 2008, we did a major survey of Latinos in Rhode Island, a random sample scientific survey, the Latino National Survey. So the, the facts which are reported on this slide are facts as we've determined them from the best social science research we can do about the political attitudes, the lifestyles, the choices, the political behavior of Latinos in Rhode Island. These are just Rhode Island. Rhode Island Latinos actively plant roots in the U.S. economy and society. The majority of Latinos in Rhode Island have purchased homes in their communities. And either they complete or they have a close family member who has completed military service. A majority of Latinos in Rhode Island have either personally completed military service or have a family member who has worn the U.S. Army or another uniform of the United States of America, just as my grandfather did in 1917 in the First World War, just as my father did in 1950 in the Korean War. Latinos are among the most patriotic of all Americans, and in fact, Mexican Americans of all the populations in the United States per capita have received more congressional medals of honor than any other racial or ethnic population in the United States. The majority of Rhode Island Latinos plan to stay in the U.S. for the rest of their lives. Latinos in Rhode Island are not planning to return to the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico or Mexico or Colombia to live. They plan to stay in Rhode Island for the rest of their lives. They seek to fully participate. And these, the, the question that we're asking here is whether it's better to try to blend in and become acculturated to American society or better to retain a separate and uh, independent culture. And the majority of Latinos in Rhode Island uh, believe that it is correct to fully participate and blend into U.S. society while maintaining connections to their own cultural traditions. It is possible to do both. It is possible to be a patriotic American. It is possible to be fully acculturated as an American and still retain affection and cultural and political ties with a nation of origin. Rhode, Rhode Island Latinos, again, this is in response to a question asking people what they believe. Rhode Island Latinos stress the importance of learning English as well as the importance of maintaining Spanish in their own families, in the Latino community at large. Rhode Island Latino parents hold extremely high aspirations for their children and expect their children to attain those goals. Latinos are often described in popular culture as being disconnected from education, not caring very much about education. Latino parents are often described as being unable or unwilling to help their children achieve the best education they can. The reality is if you go to any public school in the city of Providence, Pawtucket or Central Falls, the night of the teacher meetings and the open houses, you will find that 90 or 95 percent of the parents attending those meetings are Latino parents. Latino parents are known by teachers as being among the most engaged and most participatory parents in any school system where there are Latino students. So the myth that Latino parents and children are not fully invested in education is just that. A majority of Rhode Island Latinos are registered voters. A majority of Rhode Island Latinos actively participated in the last election. A significant proportion of Rhode Island Latinos, contrary to the trope or the expectation that Latinos are Democrats, a significant, a large and significant proportion of Latinos in Rhode Island are either independent or undecided. Uh, it is true that the ma a majority of Latinos are Democrats, and even those, Demo those Latinos who self-identify as independents tend to vote for Democratic candidates, but they do not feel the, uh, uh, the close uh, connection to the Democratic Party and the permanent connection that is sometimes attributed to them. If we just look at Latino immigrants, that is, Latinos who were born in another country and immigrated to the United States, a majority of Rhode Island Latino immigrants have never received any government assistance of any kind. Now this again is contrary to the mythology that Latinos, especially undocumented immigrants to the United States, are here to receive a handout from the government, are here to receive benefits. In fact, a majority of Latino immigrants have never received government assistance. A significant portion, a plurality, not a majority, but a significant portion of Rhode Island Latinos 
do not send money back to the home countries. They do not send remittances. It is true that for the majority of U.S. born Latinos, uh, money is not sent out of the country. In fact, Latinos invest their money in the U.S. economy in a variety of ways, such as buying homes in their communities. A majority, finally on the racial question, a majority of Rhode Island Latinos do not see themselves as being in competition with African Americans. Rather, they see their success as linked with the success of the African American community. On May 1st, 2006, almost six years ago, the largest protest demonstrations in U.S. history took place. More than three million people demonstrated for fair and comprehensive immigration reform. The vast majority of those people were Latinos. And in hundreds or thousands of those demonstrations all around the country, the most prominent protest sign that those demonstrators held was a very simple one. It said, end racism. I cannot, for the life of me, imagine how a million people holding signs saying end racism can possibly be bad for black people. So the idea, and you've heard this idea, if you've lived in this country, you've heard the idea that blacks and Latinos are inherently and inevitably in conflict. That is simply false. In fact, every single African American member of Congress in the state of California, let me say that again, every single black member of Congress in the state of California represents a majority Latino district. David Dinkins in New York City was elected with overwhelming Latino support. Harold Washington in Chicago elected with overwhelming Latino support. Doug Wilder in Virginia, overwhelming Latino support. And in fact, in the election of 2008, if you look at all of the population groups in the American electorate, men, women, blue collar workers, white collar workers, um, Jews, Catholics, Protestants, Latinos, African Americans, Native Americans, slice and dice the American electorate any way you want. There was only one identifiable population group that gave a larger share of its vote to Barack Obama than Latinos, and that was African Americans. So we have African Americans at almost 90%, Latinos almost 70%, and then you go way down to the low 50s before you get to Jews and women. A majority of white, blue-collar male workers in the United States voted for John McCain. The overwhelming majority of non-white blue-collar workers everywhere in America voted for Barack Obama. So the idea that Latinos will not vote for or support uh, an African-American candidate or African-American political movement is simply false. In fact, if we go back in history to the 1960s and 1970s, we'll find the Brown Berets who, who modeled their, their political strategy, even their dress explicitly uh, after the Black Panthers. We'll find uh, Latino organizations all over the country uh, that work side by side with African American civil rights organizations. And just as we saw in May of 2006, many of those Latino political movements were geared not only towards improving opportunities and benefits for Latinos, but they were geared towards ending racism because as we saw very early, most of the Latinos in the United States have experienced uh, racism firsthand. So where do we go from here? Uh, I hope I've given you a little bit more information about the composition and the, and the distribution of the Latino population. You know a little bit more, perhaps, than you did before about Latinos in Rhode Island and Latino influence on elections. But what comes next? In a, let's see. Nationally, as more Americans recognize the scope of this Latino-centered national transformation, uh, given what I've told you tonight, it would be hard for any of you to argue that the United States is not undergoing a profound demographic, trans demographic transformation and that Latinos are the primary force in that transformation. As more and more Americans recognize this, political candidates, government officials, and party organizations may be forced to adapt to new environments. They may be forced to consider the needs and the interests of Latino leaders and voters. Latinos are likely to move to the center of electoral strategies in presidential, congressional, and state-level political competition uh, for, and for both major political parties. Even this year, in the earliest Republican presidential primaries of 2012, despite the fact that the Republican Party has, over the last several years has supported immigration and education policies which are broadly unpopular with Latinos, aspirants, Republican aspirants for the party's nomination found it imperative to tailor some messages to skeptical Latino electorates, even in constituencies as different as Florida and Nevada. If you've been following the Republican nomination uh, uh, primary battle, you might have seen more than once 
that one or more of the, of the Republican candidates for president have toyed with the idea of naming Marco Rubio or Susana Martinez or Brian Sandoval, all Republican uh, statewide office holders, Latino statewide office holders, as their vice presidential nominee. Uh, it's unlikely that any of them will actually be selected, but the, re the, the fact that Republican candidates for president, even after all of the anti-Latino and anti-immigrant rhetoric that's come from the Republican Party leadership over the last several years, still found it necessary to try to appeal to as many Republican voters as possible. The conventional wisdom is that in 2012, uh, a candidate that does not receive at least 40% of the Latino vote nationwide will not and cannot be elected president. A Republican candidate who does not receive 40% of the Latino vote cannot and will not be elected president. The likelihood that Mitt Romney will receive 40% of the Latino vote is virtually zero. So I'm not the only person, and some of you are not the only people, who uh, may feel that the remainder of the presidential campaign season is a moot point. That unless the Republican Party can significantly increase its support among Latinos, the likelihood that we'll have a Republican president after this year's election is very small. Now, anything can happen. I'm not making a prediction. We've seen the last few days some unexpected things have happened with uh, Mitt Romney and, uh, um, uh, and with Obama's uh, campaign supporters, but uh, other things being equal, unless something dramatic happens between now and November, uh, uh, it's unlikely that Latinos will give more than 40% of the vote to the Republican candidate. Beyond the presidential race, in such non-traditional states for Hispanic influence as Montana, not exactly the first state you think of when you think about Latino influence, Nebraska, Missouri, Latino vote choices, because even though the Latino vote share in those states may be relatively small, less than 10% of the electorate, the Republican and Democratic candidates for U.S. Senate in those states right now are less than 10 percentage points apart in the public opinion polls. So even in those states of non-traditional states for Hispanic influence, the Senate elections this year might be determined by the vote choices made by Latino voters, not just in those individual races, but if enough seats change hands, control of the U.S. Senate itself may be at stake. In Rhode Island, Latino voters in 2012 may once again hold the key to the state's gubernatorial and congressional election outcomes, and they may achieve increased representation in legislative and municipal offices. Several weeks ago, uh, when the redistricting plan was still being debated, uh, there was a controversy lasted for a minute or two uh, when one of the redistricting plans moved uh, several thousand voters on the south side of Providence uh, from the second congressional district into the first congressional district. Uh, that was said at the time to be uh, a plan that would have given advantages to uh, Cicilline, the Democratic candidate in the first district, the Democratic incumbent. Well, think for a second. Why would moving a few thousand voters from one neighborhood make such a difference? Because most of the voters in that neighborhood are Latino. That is why that move, that, that relatively small change in the lines, was thought by everyone observing to be so potentially significant because the vast majority of the voters in those neighborhoods are Latinos. The same Latinos who put Ralph Mollis in the Secretary of State's office, and the same Latinos who put Lincoln Chafee in the Governor's office. Lincoln Chafee won by a smaller percentage of the vote than the overall Latino vote, and in all likelihood, less even than the number of Latinos who voted for him. Uh, I'm, I didn't make this up. This isn't my idea. There was an article in the paper a few weeks after the election where Catherine Gregg for the Providence Journal, almost as an aside, said, uh, uh, Governor Lincoln Chafee, comma, whose election is attributed to the Latino vote, comma, and then continued with her sentence. So it has become conventional wisdom in Rhode Island that both the governor and the secretary of state and in all likelihood first district congressmen owe their positions in 2012 to the Latino electorate. What I'd like to do at this point is take a few minutes to uh, catch my breath and, and have a drink of water. I'll give you a chance to uh, think of some questions. I would like to do something that's not in the prepared script, which is to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the Latino communities in Rhode Island right now as we speak. Uh, politics is a moving train. It never stops. Uh, all of the data and all of the discussions that we've been involved in so far tonight are about the past, with the exception of a handful of speculations about the future. So let me catch a drink and you catch your, catch your breath and ask me some questions. Any questions before I move on? Comments? Yes, Jeremy.
absorb and to contextualize. I want to ask a sort of national scale question that might lead you to reflect on your own experience as an educator in New England, um, within the New England context. Um, many of you may be aware of Arizona's uh, new law uh, essentially banning the teaching, I believe it's in Tucson or it might Tucson, be in yeah, Tucson, Tucson, Arizona. Um, cancellation of Latino and Chicano studies in the uh, public school curriculum. Um, and of course, Arizona is one of those border states. Tucson is a 50% plus county, right? Uh, if you think back to that map. Um, given the trend lines, and given the 40% uh, you know, increase on a, on a 10 year basis, um, this seems to me, and not only me, as the sort of last throws of a kind of white power kind of complex, right? To sort of say, no, your curriculum cannot reflect you know, the, the stories and histories that you know, the majority of our, of our school students in Tucson um, bring into the classroom. Um, what's your opinion about that, and more broadly about sort of the um, utility and the, the, um, the, the sort of cropping up of learning studies or cultural studies like programs? in primary and secondary schools throughout the country? Well, I, I follow the Tucson controversy uh, pretty closely, and, and the most significant fact about it is that uh, the Chicano students who went through courses in the Mexican American Studies program had a much higher graduation rate and a much higher college acceptance rate than students who did not. So forget all the rhetoric about what they were being taught and the anti-Americanism that was presumed to be part of that curriculum. I've also looked at the curriculum, and it's not. It's exactly the kinds of information that I teach to my students at Providence College and Brown University. It's exactly what uh, ethnic studies and Latino studies programs all around the country teach. It's about history. It's about the history of Mexican Americans in the Southwest. It's about the Mexican American War. It's about the agricultural farm workers movement. It's about the, the Latino uh, Chicano civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s. It's perfectly innocuous history of events that actually happened. The interesting thing that happens when Chicano students are exposed to their own history is they get excited about education. They get excited about success. They get excited about their own futures. And uh, it's, I, don't, I can't look inside the minds of the people who dismantled that program, but it, it's ironic to me that anyone, in this, given the trend lines that you talked about, would see any value in undermining the very program that is increasing the academic educational success rate of Latino students. I wouldn't suggest that perhaps that is the goal of undermining the program to jeopardize the academic success, success, of, success of Latinos, but it's certainly possible. Without evidence, I can't rule out that hypothesis either. In terms of uh, ethnic studies more broadly, uh, as, as you might know, I was the founder of the Black Studies program at Providence College back in 1995. I was a co-founder of the uh, research subsection on race, ethnicity, and politics in the American Political Science Association. Uh, we, are, we went from having no members at all in 1995 to 2012, we're now the ninth largest research field in political science, which is one of the largest academic fields in the United States. Uh, my personal experience is that ethnic studies at the university level, ethnic studies at the high school, even the, the middle school level, has the same effect on students at all of those levels that the Chicano Studies program had in Tucson. Students of color, Latino, African American, Native American, Asian American students do much better in school. They become more successful when they graduate. They're more likely to go on to higher education when they have been exposed during their formal education to honest, accurate, scientific, and social scientific information about their own roots, about their own histories, about their own cultures. There's nothing threatening about that at all, unless you are motivated to prevent that kind of economic and social progress. If you go back to the, the slide at the very beginning about the socioeconomic economic status of Latinos, you recall that Latinos tend to be, as a population, less well-educated, lower income, uh, lower paying jobs, more likely to be unemployed, and so on. Well, everyone in the room has probably heard, rightly so, that education is the ticket out. Education is how an individual or a population rises through the class structure, rises through socioeconomic levels, and achieves something like the American dream. So anything that we can do, whether it's a multicultural program, intercultural activities and programs, ethnic studies uh, instruction, um, uh, uh, cultural and artistic uh, programs, uh, special events, clubs, and so on, whatever we can do, 
to increase the self-confidence and increase the cultural literacy of the nation's uh, uh, non, non, non-Hispanic white population uh, is a good thing. Because as you know, by 2050, a majority of the nation's population will not be white. And at that point, in two, probably will happen before then. That's just the estimate the Census Bureau of Andy's about. But I wrote a piece in 2000 where I thought I was on firm ground when I said sometime in the next seven years, the Latino population will exceed the black population. In fact, it happened almost before the ink was dry on that journal pages. So the Latino population is now somewhat larger than the black population. Based on that experience, I'm reluctant to say it won't be until 2050. It might be 2030 uh, that the white population is actually the minority population in the United States. I'm not afraid of that moment. I don't think it's a bad thing. That's just life. White folks make up less than 7% of the world's population. Think about that number. Less than 7% of the world's population. So I'm not concerned about the uh, transition to a more representative America. I think it's a good thing, and I think it's good for all of us. So I want as many well-educated Latino, Asian American, Native American, African American people as possible, because those are the workers whose higher earnings will support my Social Security pension when it comes time for me to retire. Those are the workers whose ability to earn, ability to buy, ability to consume will be the economic base and the economic engine for the whole country. So I think it's in everybody's interest to produce the best educated, most successful, and most self-confident uh, population we can, whatever color and whatever ethnic background they might have. Did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Yes. Professor Speakman. <laughs> As you probably know, in Bristol in particular, and throughout the East Bay and Fall River, there's a large um, Portuguese and Cape population, which is different, I understand, but do you see the opportunity for alliances or, or any kind of similar analysis applied to that? Uh, well, years ago, in the, in the 1960s, at, the, at the, what a lot of people would call the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, but we actually know it's not at the middle of the Civil Rights Movement, there was uh, something of a cultural schism between the black American and the Cape Verdean population. The older Cape Verdeans insisted that they were not black. Now, not all. I don't want to universalize, but it's, a, it's an accurate generalization. Younger Cape Verdeans who were in high school, in college, even, even younger, actually identified with the black population and identified very strongly with Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and the Civil Rights Movement. Those folks are now my age or even older. So the center of gravity in the Cape Verdean community shifted long ago towards black America. The Portuguese population is, is a little bit different. The Portuguese and Azorean population is somewhat different. Uh, Providence College, until recently, was one of the few institutions in Rhode Island that still counted Portuguese as minorities. So when cat tallying up the minority population of Providence College, they would always report these outrageous numbers, like, you know, 18%. And we'd be looking at them, like, where are they hiding these people? And then we look at the numbers and find out they were counting, you know, several hundred or, or several dozen uh, Portuguese American students as minorities. Now, at a certain point in the 1960s, uh, that designation as minority was um, acceptable to the Portuguese-American population. I don't think it is anymore. I don't think the Portuguese-American leadership uh, chooses when they have a choice to self-identify as minority. So uh, I guess the answer to your question is that the Portuguese and Azorean communities go in one direction, and the Cape Verdean community goes in the other direction. Uh, I've, uh, we were talking a little bit before my lecture about the, the puzzling um, history of Portuguese immigration, immigrants in, in southern New England uh, just never seemed to have developed the kind of explicit political and social power that the numbers would justify. Uh, the Portuguese community in Rhode Island could be much more powerful economically, socially, and politically than it is now. And I, I haven't studied it, so I can't give you any valid explanations for that. But it's certainly something I've noticed. I, I lived for many years in Fox Point, surrounded by uh, P Fox Point in Providence, surrounded by Portuguese and Cape Verdean culture. And I know that the, it's a vibrant, uh, engaged, uh, civically uh, very active community. And why that never translated into any explicit political power, I, I simply can't explain. Yes, Paola. Um, one of the figures you didn't mention, but that we know from marketing and advertising, is that Latinos comprise the fastest growing uh, disposable income in the country. Uh, it's now well over $1 trillion in disposable income every year. 
Um, and I was just wondering if we marry that statistic with the fact that we know from focus groups that Latinos and Asians are the family groups that prize education the most and educational attainment, and we throw in the fact that Latino families like to keep their children close to home. I wonder if you could speak to the opportunity that your institution and Roger Williams University might have in terms of maybe attempting to attract Latinos uh, into our academic environments. Do you see strategies there that might pay off? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, in, in one of my other roles, I'm a member of the uh, Diversity Advisory Council for Ruth Simmons, the president of Brown University. Uh, as a member of that council, I hear periodic reports every few months from the admissions director, uh, the financial aid office, the deans, uh, the alumni, public relations, all of the, all of the parts of, of Brown that reach out into the broader community. And one of the things I remember from a, a presentation by Jim Miller, the admissions director, a few months ago, he showed line graphs for the uh, relative population shares of, at the high school level of white high school graduates, Latino, Asian American, Native American, and African American high school graduates. And the white high school graduation population is projected to look like this for the foreseeable future. The Latino high school age population looks like this. Now, in addition, combined with the income and, and, and consumer power uh, number that you're talking about, a trillion dollars in buying power, the lesson that Brown took from that is that they need to get real busy, real serious, real fast about marketing the university appropriately to Latino high school students all over America. Because any college or university that does not do that will be at a significant competitive disadvantage as the part of the white population, which is both college age and affluent enough to, to consider college, gets smaller relative to the uh, African American and the Latino and Asian populations in particular. So the, my general answer would be that any university in any part of the country that aspires to continued excellence and continued financial stability and continued ability to generate revenue from alumni needs to look very closely at what they may or may not be doing with respect to recruiting Latino students. Now, I don't have any idea how many Latino students there are at Roger Williams. I presume it's a significant number simply because you're located in Rhode Island where Latinos are the fastest growing part of the population. If it's not a significant part of your admission pool, a significant part of your student population, then you need to have a meeting and start planning how to make it a more significant part because this, this train does not stop. Uh, what I would do is I would look at, uh, at, just as Brown has done, Brown looks at their competing institutions. Uh, Brown knows that 60% of the students that are, uh, are accepted to Brown and choose to go elsewhere, 60% of those students go to the same 10 schools. So they know exactly who their competitors are. I would assume that every college or university has some list somewhere of their comp competitor schools. What I would do is I would look at those schools and see what are they doing to recruit and attract Latino students. If you're not keeping up, then you're going to fall behind, whether it's Roger Williams or any other university. I've, I've made the same argument at Providence College, and it's beginning to bear fruit. I have significant, increasing numbers of Latino students in my classes. The black student population is finally beginning to rise at Providence College. And it's partly because people's attitudes have changed. It's partly because those graphs have changed. And people who are looking around the curve can see that the future of higher education in America lies with the same population where resides the future of American politics and the future of American consumer, uh, consumer goods and production. And of course, the labor force in most areas, pick an area of service employment, whether it's health care or education or uh, 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 hospitality or agriculture, uh, even industry. In almost every one of those areas, it is the Latino workforce which is growing the fastest. In, in California, for instance, the labor movement is increasingly Latino. The leaders of the labor movement in Southern California are overwhelmingly Latino elected officials, elected union officials. That transformation of one of the core elements of American uh, politics and society, that is the workforce, is spreading across the country very quickly. Uh, most agriculture, most of you, in fact, I can say this without any doubt whatsoever, 90% uh, of the food that you have eaten, fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables that you've eaten in your entire life was picked by a Latino. 90% of all the food, fruit and vegetables that you have ever put into your body was harvested, was planted, cultivated, fertilized, uh, and harvested by Latinos. 
So that phenomenon is now spreading to other sectors of the labor market as well. It, it varies from place to place. Um, I, uh, years ago, I spent some time in Rhode Island Hospital. One of my children was, had some surgery. And at that time, yes, there were black and Latino people working in Rhode Island Hospital. They were all unit secretaries or um, people, the transport staff transporting patients from place to place. Well, I had occasion to spend some time in Rhode Island Hospital again last summer, and the African, African American, Latino, and Southeast Asian labor force now extends from the bottom to the very top. The chief of infectious medicine for the state of Rhode Island is an African doctor. The uh, nurses, uh, doctors, surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons are now increasingly black, Latino, Asian, and in some parts of the country, in the upper Midwest and the Southwest, Native American as well. I'm not afraid of this. I love it. It's great. The more the merrier. But apparently, there are people or there are places where this new reality is disturbing. And we need to get over that. There's nothing disturbing about good medicine. There's nothing disturbing about well-educated teachers. There's nothing disturbing about astronauts whose name happens to be Hernandez. He flew that space shuttle just fine, thank you. There's no problem. So I, I, I think it, I, I know I've gone all around the barn with this, but I think the best answer to your question is that every college and university needs to look very closely at their recruitment and retention strategies with respect to students of color, especially Latino students, because that is the future of higher education, and that is the future of the American labor market. And that is also your social security check. Yeah? Go one step back to the point that you were making about um, uh, about the anxiety, and um, when you were sort of talking about the impact of Latino voters and on um, Rhode Island elections, you mentioned Laughlin's ad, the wall. You know that image is so is so potent, and it seems to work. It seems to work so well. Um, I'm with you. I grew up in I grew up in majority Latino populations in Florida and California. I live halfway between Cranston Street and Elmwood Street, Providence now. So, um, you know, I, I find myself sometimes sort of not knowing quite what to say to folks who genuinely do harbor this notion on the one hand that there is, um, uh, that undocumented immigration is actually putting other, other members of American society at this big cultural, social, economic, and um, you know, other kinds of uh, disadvantages. Um, and uh, on the other hand, folks who, um, I lost between thought. I find it hard to respond to those anxieties in, in any other way than to think that they are terribly misinformed and racist. So I sort of wondered, like, you know, if you offered me two or three things to say that, um, that actually sort of would have, would have the potential to, like, not start an argument, but to, but to inform a person in a, in, a, in a helpful way, you know, what kind of stuff that can we all get out there with that starts to turn that image around. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, seriously though, I, I, I mean, first thing I tell people is relax. It's going to be okay. I remember in 1992, I had, uh, for some reason, my freshmen that year were, were mostly Republicans, and a lot of them were active Republicans voting, uh, rep working for, was that Bush? Yeah, that was Bush running for re-election. When I say active Republicans, I mean, I would open up the Providence Journal and see my students hanging signs over Route 95, like the right, Bush, uh, Bush quail? Was it quail? Was it potato guy? Okay. Um, and I had to tell them, it's, and, but as time went on, of course, it became more and more obvious that Clinton was going to win that election. Didn't matter what Bush said or didn't say. The economy had changed. The, you know, the economy was in bad straits. And um, and I, I, had, I told him, relax. It's going to be okay. You're going to wake up the day after the election, and everything's going to be exactly the same. Right? And I, I have kind of the same feeling about people who have this anxiety about the diversification, the beautiful, magical diversification of this country. It's going to be okay. In fact, you're probably going to like it. It's going to be nice. It's going to be better. It's going to be more vibrant. It's going to be more colorful. It's going to be more free. It's going to be more democratic. All the things that are supposedly good about America, they're going to, we're going to have more of it. The only thing holding it back is people fighting against it and vigilantes and camis killing people on the Arizona border. That can cause problems. Or vigilantes in Florida killing people with Skittles. That can cause problems. If these well-armed 
people who have such high levels of anxiety would just chill out, things would be fine. You don't see that. I mean, you just don't see a lot of hostility coming from the other side. In fact, I have a photograph. I, I, I almost brought it, but she would have killed me. Um, a photo of my wife, uh, Melba de Pena, who is a, a Latino community activist, and Doris de los Santos, who is uh, the governor's, now the governor's director of uh, municipal and government affairs. The two of them at Chafee's victory celebration, the night of the election, over at, uh, uh, what hotel is it down by the airport? The Sheraton or something? No, no, the, right, right next to the airport. Yeah, in Warwick. I think it's Sheraton. Um, in a room full of sort of, I'll just say it, a bunch of white people. A whole room full of, you know, kind of middle-aged or older, somewhat affluent, you know, white folks. And here are these two happy Latinas, right? And I was happy too, I was taking the picture. And in the background of the photo are some folks that I've never, I don't think I've ever been in the same room with before. Uh, but the Chafee campaign brought together people from a lot of different places. And what I saw there, I just saw happiness. I didn't see anxiety, I didn't see hostility. What I saw, and this is a, a, another difference as well that I didn't talk about very much, Latinos, especially immigrant Latinos, don't come to the game with the kind of preconceptions that other minority populations in the U.S. have come to it with. Latinos, especially Latino immigrants, come with the expectation that they will be treated fairly, that this is a land of opportunity and equality, that they can talk to anybody. All you need to do is learn English and, and, and you have an opportunity to be fully integrated and acclimated. So there's a kind of an openness on the part of the Latino political community, which some white folks are not used to experiencing. They're still carrying the, the more angry messages of the civil rights movement in their heads. That's what a lot of white folks think we're talking about when we talk about diversification and, and growing minority populations. It's not like that at all. It's not like that. Uh, the minority populations today, whether you're talking about young people, middle-aged people, old people, immigrants, non-immigrants, just want to get along and get a job and work hard and raise a family and buy a house and do everything that everybody else in American history has ever wanted to do. So the only, I, I don't know what else I can say. But my best answer to them is just relax, chill out, wait a minute, it'll be okay. <laughs> just don't get too upset. I mean, because that will cause a problem. Right? The hostility, the venom, that, who's not going to react? What happened to SB 1070? You remember SB 1070, the bill in Arizona that criminalized uh, immigrants for like breathing? And then made it legal for police officers to, if they had reasonable suspicion that the person might not be a legal immigrant, to ask them for their paper. Remember SB 1070? Many parts of it have been uh, invalidated by the federal courts. But, uh, you know, the lead sponsor of that bill, Senator Pierce, was defeated in, a, in, in the very next election because Latino voters came out by the thousands in his district and put him out of office. Now, by definition, these are citizens. These are not the people that he was talking about. These are Latino citizens. In California, Prop 187, Prop 209, when the Republicans gained power in California and started poking the dog, the, in the Republican Party in California and, and activists who sponsored a referendum uh, approved a law by referendum, it wasn't the legislature, that would have required kindergarten teachers to check the legal status of the children, five-year-olds. The kindergarten teachers would have to ask five-year-old children to prove that they were legal immigrants or that they were citizens. The teachers union said, we're not doing it. The, the ACLU, of course, uh, filed suit. Uh, anti, uh, Latino activist organizations all over California went into the streets. 10,000 Latino students, Chicano students, in the Los Angeles school system walked out of school. They met in the park in San Diego. Students walked 12 miles to get to the park in downtown San Diego for a mass demonstration against these bills. And you may know, if you don't know, I'll tell you right now, that whole attempt to criminalize and, and to, and to uh, marginalize Latino immigrants in California has taken California out of the competitive column for the foreseeable future. No Republican candidate for statewide office or for president in California can count on any significant likelihood of success for as far out as we can see. Because those kids that were walking 12 miles to get to the demonstration in San Diego are now on their second or third election. And there's no way they're going to vote for Pete Wilson or any of, the, any of the other people, people like Pete Wilson, who impose those kinds of restrictions. So, again, my point is, if you poke the Latino dog, the Latino population, the Latino political community, you're going to get a backlash. If you just go with it and deal with the changes in American society, everything is going to be just fine. What happened to Laughlin after he ran those Mexicans scaling the wall into Tiverton ads? He lost. 
He lost. I was going to follow up on that because so recently I was teaching the Socratic dialogues and I was reminded in the apology uh, of how little people tend to care about facts and logic. And in the apology, Socrates is defending himself very, very logically and with, a, with an array of, of uh, factual representations of his history and nonetheless uh, is sentenced to die. And I, it, what strikes me is that um, people are deeply influenced by culture and by sort of those stereotypes that you mentioned earlier on in the, in the beginning of your presentation, sometimes a lot more than they are with a bevy of, of facts and, uh, and data. Um, the same is true of environmental you know, issues as we've explored here at Roger Williams. You can present people with, with these facts and they still believe that global warming is a myth or, or something like that. What I wonder is, um, Given what you were saying about the um, increasing prevalence of um, Latino or Spanish language uh, radio and, and television, uh, and the lack still of non-stereotypical representations of Latinos in Hollywood films and, and sort of big budget mass media, um, where do you see the potential for cultural change coming from? Because a lot of, a lot of the Spanish stations I listen to they seem to kind of echo, in some ways, some of the stereotypes about Latinos. They have characters like Piolin, who kind of who, who speak in, in certain stereotypical modes. Or if you look at like Televisión and Telemundo and stuff, you, you, it's like it's all of these like blue-eyed, blonde-haired, white, 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 white. With black men. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And so I'm I'm wondering like where you see um, hope for change in that. Uh, in oh, okay. Time. That's a that's a good question. Uh, the answer is it's, it's actually very complex. Uh, there's a lot more going on in Spanish language media than this, just those crazy telenovelas. There's also Latino public radio, which is doing some of the best public affairs broadcasting in Rhode Island, bar none. Uh, there is also uh, Eva Longoria. Anybody know her? Yeah. yeah. You know she's going to be the executive producer of a new sitcom with four Latina actresses? They're going to start. They're going to be four Latinas. I, I think it's called Desperate Maids. <laughs> Anybody heard about that? It's, 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 in, the, it's in the works. Um, so you have those kinds of things. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, when uh, shows like Kingpin were being broadcast on television and, and, and viewers were being treated to yet another dose of, you know, fabulously wealthy Latino drug lords and stuff. Mi Familia was also released by Hollywood, produced by Francis Ford Coppola, uh, directed by Gregory Nava. This beautiful multi-generational narrative about a, a Mexican-American family in Los Angeles with a whole series of exquisitely positive but accurate uh, and somewhat troubled representation of Latinos, starting with the Mexican Revolution and getting all the way up uh, to the 1990s. So my answer is, I can't stop those people from doing what they do but I can continue to support and I can continue to encourage the kind of alternative depictions that are increasingly visible. One other anecdote along those lines, I don't remember the name of the show because I never watched it, I just barfed at the commercials. Remember that show about these two guys that would dress as women to get a job out, of, out, of, out at work or something? Like, well, from huh? no. no, from like a few weeks ago. Oh. It, was a, it was a new show, it only lasted like three episodes, it got cancelled. But the, the storyline was these two men, because this is a man session, you know, we know that men, men are supposedly suffering more than women in this recession. So they decided the only way they could get a job would be to dress in drag and apply for jobs as women. So they were obviously men, you'd have to be like, I don't know, anyway. But the, the, in the very first episode, one of them said, they were talking about what they could do to earn a living, and one of them, who was Puerto Rican, he said, well, I'm Puerto Rican, we could, we could always sell drugs, we're good at that. That was in the pilot, right? And the demonstration started immediately. And the show was canceled after three episodes, and about four days ago, ABC Television issued a formal apology to Latinos in broadcasting, an advocacy group that had been challenging them. They canceled the show, well, folks kept demonstrating, ABC headquarters in New York. They said that they, were, they, they uh, regretted the programming decision, but they didn't apologize. People kept on demonstrating. People didn't stop demonstrating until ABC TV issued an, a formal apology and said that they would, they'd learn their lesson and they would be much more careful about perpetrating, perpetuating these negative stereotypes of Latinos in their, in their primetime broadcasting. Uh, do you remember Kramer? Remember Kramer on, uh, what was that crazy, Seinfeld, right? Um, Kramer? Now, I had some students one time that did a, they actually did a study, they looked at six weeks of Seinfeld, Friends, and I can't remember their third show, but like that. 
Um, and they looked for black or brown faces anywhere on the screen. And in six weeks, there were none. Zero black faces. Now think about that for a second. You're filming on the streets of New York City. How can you possibly never, even by accident, have a Puerto Rican walking down the sidewalk in the back of the scene? Now think about it. Now there were white folks walking back and forth. You know, extras or just random passers-by. Now I know this because I, I went to my daughter's uh, college graduation uh, at NYU and Woody Allen was filming a, a, a scene out on the sidewalk out in front of her department. So I was, <laughs> yeah, I walked up. They chased me out of that scene so fast, not because I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, but just because they're aware of everybody who's walking around. If you're going to appear in the frame, they have people assigned to chase you out. That's how a location shoots are. So how do they do 10 years of Seinfeld and never have a single black or brown face anywhere in the background? Unless somebody, but the white folks are walking around, unless somebody specifically chases the colored folks out and leaves everybody else alone. Well, now that's, I'm not, what I'm saying is not completely true because there was one episode of Seinfeld where the whole episode was Puerto Ricans. It was the episode where Kramer got upset because he couldn't get to where he was going because the Puerto Rican parade was going on. He grabbed a Puerto Rican flag, threw it on the ground, and stomped the Puerto Rican flag on national television. Does that sound like a good idea for a show set in New York City? Well, the, the, the backlash was ferocious. And once again, the, the network and the writers and the producers had to apologize. Now, it, it was kind of ironic. Now, you know what happened to him later. Yeah. Okay, so he, he was perfect. He didn't mind stomping the Puerto Rican flag. It probably seemed like a good idea to him. But what I'm trying to do by kind of walking all around the barn is to tell you that it's not as simple as they always portray us in a bad way. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we portray ourselves more accurately, and sometimes even when we're portrayed negatively, we have enough power to stop it or take it off the air or at least raise a ruckus so that people learn their lesson. And that will just get more, that's going to get more and more frequent. I don't expect that television or broadcasting is going to get more racist or more, uh, more exclusive or more, uh, more prone to demean and uh, you know, badly uh, depict Latino. I don't believe it's going in that direction at all. We'll have fits and starts. Like global warming, it gets warm, gets cold, gets warm, right? But the trend is like this. Well, we got the same thing. It's going to get better, going to get worse, going to get better. But the trend is much better. And Eva Longoria can do whatever she wants. Did you know Eva Longoria is a graduate student at Cal State Northridge? She's getting a master's degree in Chicano studies. The next time somebody says something about Eva, Eva, you tell them. She's smart. She's only this tall, but she's really smart. Questions? Any more? Yes. That's an excellent question, and I've actually been pleasantly surprised at how little impact it has had in that regard. Uh, it wasn't Latinos who said he's one of us, right? It, it wasn't people, Latino activists that he'd worked with for 20 years and community improvement who said, I mean, the guy's been invisible. So as far, and uh, the reality is his mother is Peruvian, right? And his father is white American. Uh, as far as we know, he has never identified as Hispanic. He has never participated in Hispanic community or educational activities. Um, but even if he had, even if he had, um, there's been very little discussion of that. A handful of African-American, you know, activists were saying, you people need to say more. Well, what would happen when they did that? Anybody know? When a handful of uh, black activists started saying, you know, we need to hear more from the Latino leadership. They heard from the Latino leadership the very next day. The National Council of La Raza, LULAC. Uh, um, uh, Rosa Rosales, the president of LULAC, made a statement, uh, the leadership at National Council of La Raza, condemning the killing and insisting that this is exactly the same kind of racial profiling that happens to Latinos all the time. And if his name had been Paco Cruz, he would also be dead. So I mean, that kind of response was immediate. Maybe it should have happened more quickly, but I, I don't think most Latino activists had any idea this guy was claiming to be Hispanic. It was his father who said that. His father said, he's not white, he's his You know, that's just weird. Uh, so uh, fortunately, I think it has not yielded the kind of uh, controversy that it might have. And I think partly because the Latino leadership responded very quickly, but also because African Americans in Florida know better. 
I mean, African Americans in Florida have been, especially those who are more to the Democratic side than the Republican side, know that there's a big difference among Latinos. Not all Latinos are created equal. There has historically been a great deal of co uh, conflict in uh, Miami between the, uh, the Cuban American community and the African American community. In fact, the Overton riots in 1986, Overton, Miami, massive riots, you know, uh, neighbor, the Overton neighborhood in Miami, that was sparked when a white, white Cuban police officer shot a black stockbroker off of his motorcycle. Stockbroker. Um, and it sparked riots in the Overton black community. So in a state that has seen that kind of Hispanic black conflict, um, you know, you would think you might see more with Trayvon Martin, but, but if you finish the story that Overton is the Hispanic community repudiated the guy. They didn't say that was a good thing he shot the brother off a motorcycle. In fact, the, the Latino community leadership in, in Miami was standing at the rallies and protests side by side with the black community leadership also condemning the shooting. Because once again, Latinos know that we are likely to be subject to police violence, police brutality, racial profiling, just as quickly as African Americans. It depends on where you are in the, in the country, of course. But what Mexican American in Arizona doesn't expect to be racial profiled? And it's not going to understand when an African American in Florida talks about racial profiling. The Chicano brother in Arizona goes, mm-hmm, yep, happened to me yesterday. All right? There's that kind of shared experience that makes these kind of superficial racial you know, uh, coloring uh, less, less significant. Are we done? Thank you very much. Thank you. There are evaluations uh, being handed about. Uh, we would appreciate if you would fill them out and uh, give us some uh, feedback on this.